My Aunt Carame, she is a huge influence in my life. Since I was a little girl, I can remember running down the alley from my dad's house, you know, trying to get away from your parents because it was so much more fun to spend time with your aunt and your grandparents. And her being a school teacher, she just naturally has that draw like children and people want to draw to her because she makes you feel so comfortable in who you are and just accepts you the way that you are. But being a little girl, um, she was my best friend. She was my art teacher. I will never forget going down for art lessons. And if y'all knew me, I can't even hardly write my name. But she would put this big display on the center of the table and there would be me and my cousin sitting around and a few other kids locally and we took private art lessons. I mean, she can draw out of this world. And she would take away this cloth and then she would reveal this cantaloupe with maybe a flower setting on top of a pedestal and it was your job to pencil it in. And so, although I would lose track of focus, she would always keep me grounded and centered and to her best ability, tried to teach me how to draw. But also, she was my director. She was my uh, stage director. I began to perform. She was a drama teacher at school and I began to perform um, as they needed children throughout theater uh, when I was five years old. And I think my first play was Granddaddy Longlegs, where I was a little orphan that scrubbed the floors. And then I went on to be in Princess in the Pea, and just gradually her being an art teacher, it was just kind of instilled in me to get on stage and love to perform, which is who I like to be now. Like, I love to be on stage. I love to be sharing a part of myself with people just to get that gas from the audience or that laughter out loud or that aha moment. And so I'm going to let you meet my aunt today and see what a great, wonderful person she is. Hey, you said this place was small. Smart not. This city is small. Oh. It's like the size of Quero. Are you open for business? Yeah, yeah, I'm, no, I'm not open for money. Is it? Yeah. Gonna come in here? I'm coming around the front. Y'all still got everything out for the Beatles, huh? Well, everything stays out. We got everything out for the jurist. Josh, is my aunt, here, mine. She's really my daughter. Yes. Yeah. Her dad didn't have a <laughs> I swear, and then of course the wind blew. My aunt was 14 years old when she fell in love with the Beatles. Like any boy band, in sync, um, One Direction, Justin Bieber, he's one of my favorites, but that's not really a boy band, Backstreet Boys. Back streets, back, all right. My aunt was obsessed with the Beatles. So she gets together her girlfriends and she comes up with the Four Forever Fan Club where her and her girlfriends got together and all they did was talk about which Beatle from this boy band that they had a crush on. So on September the 18th of 1964, it was a moment that changed her life forever when the Beatles touched down after leaving Dallas and landed at this little bitty tiny airport in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. Population at that point in time in 1964 was around 2,500 people. It was a moment that changed her life forever. Sound asleep, telephones in the hallway, you know, it's black, it's got a dial, and it weighs 40 pounds, and if it rings after 9 o'clock, only Daddy answers it. The phone rang at about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. So immediately, everybody's awake, and, and uh, Dad goes to the phone. Hello? Hello? No! 
no, no. Finally, son, if you are if you are lying to me, I'll see you're grounded for the rest of your life. Here, May, come to the phone. So I got up and went to the phone. It was my next door neighbor who had been out cruising. He'd been at the polar freeze, where y'all are going. He'd been out cruising that night. And Jack, the guy that owns the polar freeze, was a pilot. He heard a jet airplane fly over Warnet Ridge to land. He said, boys, something unusual is going on. No jet airplane lands at Warnet Ridge at this hour of the night. He said, go out to the airport and see what it was. Well, those three good-for-nothing boys drove out to the airport, got there just as they were pushing the steps up to this, uh, it's a Lockheed Electra airplane, yeah, turboprop. You know, it had propellers and jet engines. And he pushed the steps up, and uh, Gene and them got there in time to see the door open, and Paul McCartney walked out. The Beatles had been playing in Dallas on their first U.S. tour. They had one open night. I mean, yeah, one open night. That uh, the next Sunday night, well, Saturday night. They uh, so they came after their performance in Dallas. They left Dallas at 11:08 and uh, flew in here because the pilot of their charter had a dude ranch at Alton, Missouri. That's about an hour and a half drive back then, uh, north of here. But we were the, the closest private airport where you could land a jet. Setting aside all that she worked hard for, her art, her drama students, Front Street Theater that she owned in this little small town, making a difference in people's lives. All of the advice that she had given, taking children like classes to New York, introducing people outside of Arkansas to this whole place they'd never been before. She set all of that aside now to open up her studio called Imagine. Now, Imagine is located on Rock and Roll Highway that's where Abbey Road and 2nd Street meet on Main, and it's where her studio is. So you can go visit her. If you're ever down around Northeast Arkansas, you need to stop in. She showcased local artists. Uh, some artists are statewide, and they showcase their talents, but it's a place for her to open up and share her story of the Beatles and sh display, show her memorabilia that she has of them. But greatest, it's where her heart is. It's her passion. And it keeps the memory of her experience as a teenager with the Beatles alive. We go to the Alamo. I'm crying. My life is over. I'm 14. There's no life after missing the Beatles, you know. And uh, she said, we're going, to the, we're going to the restaurant. It's time he'll be in there eating uh, breakfast, the pilot will. I said, Mom, how will you know who the pilot is? You know, we walked in there and there was only one man in the restaurant wearing a pilot uniform. <laughs> yeah. Who would have figured? She gets the coffee pot, she goes over to him. Oh, here, Mr. Pilot Man, you know, you're, you're, you're piloting the Beatles. And oh, so that's my daughter over there crying because she didn't My get grandparents owned the restaurant, I told yeah, you that, right? Yeah, she didn't get to see him. My daughter didn't get to see him. And my daughter's a big Beatles fan, you know. She's pouring that and he's, she's, you know, Want Ridge is a wonderful place. And he's going, Miss Snap, I can't tell you where, uh, if, uh, when the Beatles are coming back. She, you said when, so she knew they were coming back. And uh, uh, she keeps going, she said, hey, you know, my daughter thinks her life is over. It's dangerous for a 14-year-old girl to think things like that. He finally said, Miss Knapp, no more coffee, because she'd about refilled him all he could stand. He said, I can't tell you when they're coming back, I'll lose my job, but I can tell you if it were me, I wouldn't go to church tomorrow morning. Voted one of the top 10 places in the world to learn about the Beato, Beatle. <sighs> Voted one of the top 10 places in the world to learn about the Beatles by USA Today in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. That's Northeast Arkansas is Beatles at the Ridge Festival. Now you can find this festival every third weekend in September once a year. 
It attracts anywhere from 25 to 30,000 people. So it's a full weekend festival. You got vendors that come out, arts and crafts, a little bit of face painting, some fun things for the kids. There's also music and uh, live stage performances. There are talent shows with some go-go girls making the stage. But also, all of the local townspeople who are business owners, they decorate their windows and Beatles memorabilia. Of course, you can check out my aunt, who has my heart. You can check out Imagine, and I'm sure she would love to share her story again with you. It lands, and as it's taxiing toward me, by the way, my dad was a electri uh, aircraft electrician in World War II on an aircraft carrier. So he'd been around airplanes a whole lot. Uh, as that airplane is taxiing toward my, us, I was possessed by the need to be with the Beatles, as were maybe between nine or 30 other girls out there. And this airplane would, would fit on that table practically. It was so small. And all of a sudden we go, the Beatles! And we take off running, ah, Paul McCartney, Paul McCartney, you know. And we run, and I feel, I'm wearing my Easter dress, by the way, because you had to dress up. And uh, uh, I feel somebody grabbing the neck of my dress. It's Daddy. Don't you ever run toward an airplane propeller. It'll cut you up like baloney. You will not die. I've seen it happen on the aircraft carriers. You know, they hypnotize you and whatever. And, uh, you know, he was right. <laughs> so he's going, we need to go home. I'm going, oh, no, Daddy, I'm so close to see the Beatles. Don't go home. So he was a softie, so I got to stay. A few minutes later, the mayor walks up on the steps going leading up to the airplane. He says, now listen, folks, there were maybe a hundred of us there. We're not, going to have, we're not going to have you behaving that way. We want the Beatles to think that Walnut Ridge is a really good place, and, and we want to, to uh, you know, we want them to be proud they were here. We'll leave a path for them, and we won't touch them and rip on them or pull their hair or anything. He said, and when they do that, they'll go up the steps and put their stuff down, and then they'll come back and they'll they'll sign autographs for you. It's the last time I ever believed a politician. About that time, a little twin-engine airplane lands, taxis right up to the edge of the airplane, which is not the same airplane we broke at, broke into. This airplane is a. Um, is the same kind, but they um, they had taken the the other one out and brought this one in. It had everybody that was appearing with them, and Brian Epstein. It was Brian Epstein's birthday. A dad says, "Quick, get over here." He saw his friend Newell Mock, who was the photographer for the uh, Commercial Appeal, uh, the Memphis paper. This is John Lennon going by us. Wow. And I've had the picture blown up a little bit, but this is Newell Mock, Dad's photographer friend. That's John Lennon. The funny thing is, after all these years, that was taken with this little brownie uh -uh. instamatic, and look how it's blown up, because what, the negative's the size of your thumbnail? Anyway, John Lennon goes right by us. I could hardly see him. I was crying so hard. Everybody else said, oh, gosh, dog, it was so loud, so noisy. I heard the hallelujah chorus. I mean, I, the angels sang. There wasn't any screaming. He was followed by Ringo. The funny thing is, if you look right here, this is Stacy's daddy. It is? Mm -hmm. He's supposed to be standing with the family. Does that tell you anything about him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's Stacy's daddy. He is, uh, he's nine years old. He's about to turn 10. Ringo goes by. About that time, that red Suburban pulls up closer to me than you are right now. The door opens, out pops George Harrison. Wow. My daddy goes, it's a beetle, Gary May, it's a beetle. I got you a beetle, I told you I would. It's a beetle, touch him, touch him. Well, George is about to, he's about to flip out. He's just cackling, he's laughing so much. And he stands there and lets me touch him on the elbow. I'm crying hysterically. Dad is as hysterical as I am. As a matter of fact, he's so hysterical that he has trouble advancing the film. And all I have is a fabulous picture of the back of Paul McCartney. <laughs> but that's okay. That still wow. counts. You know, I, when you think about it, that there were people, 5,000 people, 10,000 people at airports waiting hours to see him. And they came to Walnut Ridge, and I was close enough to touch them. 
I mean, that was a gift from God. By the way, they didn't come back down. They didn't sign any autographs. The mayor's daughters started up the steps with the mayor, and they're holding their brand new albums and ink pens, and the crowd got a little bit disturbed. I heard Pate Snap say, if your daughters are going up there, so scary me. <laughs> and uh, the mayor and his daughter turned around. They sent their albums up there to have signed. They're signed by all four Beatles. They're worth over $150,000 each. Wow. I would be making a z really good Xerox copy and selling it. This is uh, this is the the airplane. As they, This is Newell Mock's picture as they were waiting. And if you look real closely in that window, you can see Paul McCartney looking out, looking at all of us. Wow. And all the girls will say, oh, Paul McCartney made eye contact just with me. Uh -huh. Every one of them's wrong, because he made eye contact just with me. <laughs> <laughs>